Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Marketing Cheat Codes. My name is Ed Briant, host of Marketing Cheat Codes, and I'm very excited to have Greg Crow on the show today. Um, and Greg, of course, is um, a digital asset program manager. Love meeting folks that have digital asset in their title. Greg, introduce yourself. Hey, everybody. My name is Greg Crow. I have been working in digital asset management uh, almost my entire career, honestly. And it's funny that you mention uh, having digital asset in the title because the first time I really came into my own as a manager, I kind of made up my own title for that exact purpose because I saw a lot of power in it as a digital product data lead. Um, I have mainly focused my career on the architecture and the system side of the overall content management process across a lot of different solutions and through a, a couple of different companies. And I am really excited to have this chat. Awesome. I love to meet folks also that basically write their own job descriptions, create their own titles, uh, certainly um, climb your own ladder or break the ladder and go off on your own way. I, I love those kinds of journeys. Hopefully we can get some of that out uh, today as well on your career arc. So you're currently with CarMax. That's correct. And I, I would love to talk about what's going on in the car industry and how content plays a part. And let's definitely get there. You know, the idea of being able to even find a car today is impossible. So leaning on digital to give you the, okay, you can't, you can't test drive it anymore. Your test drive is literally through a digital experience. I want to, hit on that too, but take me a little bit back to the beginning of how you got here, Greg. I know you've got some just tremendous brands on your resume. So ironically, actually, um, my, my original ambition and career was um, operations and supply chain management. So I wanted to be the guy who would be able to coordinate inventory from factories to distribution centers to consumer outposts, anywhere where you would be able to actually move concrete physical goods um, to get from source to destination. But you know, um, when I kind of entered the corporate world, um, I, was, I, I started at Kraft Heinz through a management training program. And I happened to have IT in my title. And so they put me in marketing technology um, to see how I could work with some of their systems that they, were, they had some antiquated purposes uh, for. And so I just kind of dived in, tried to see, learn as much as I could about their overall architecture, what their data was used for, where it was sourced from, how it was actually, you know, creating value for the company. And I realized no one actually knew. Everyone understood their pocket, their little silo of information. They knew this is what I do. And then as soon as it leaves or before it gets to me, it is not my problem. Um, so the first thing I really did was just talk to all of these different silos, talk to all these different isolated groups and their leaders and just made a map. I made a big old flow chart that from R and D supply chain or supply all the way down through master data into our marketing organizations, into our recipe re uh, website and out to our um, e-commerce uh, retailers how this information is created and where it goes. And um, it ended up call or solving a lot of different problems. And that's how I ended up going from just this uh, intro training project that I did to creating my title as a digital product data lead, because I was the person who knew start to finish how all this is created and how it can actually add value. Because at the end of the day, like you were saying, we're entering such a digital world that being able to customize an experience or really get your information to the niche audience you want by its destination is so crucial. But that takes a very solid foundation and a very efficient process for maintaining that. Yeah, the other thing that's so crucial as well is that um, your background, whether it was not intended to be initially you know, supply chain, that systems thinking, that total view of a supply chain as we you know fast forward today to content and ideas turning into experiences, ideas turning into you know revenue, um, that ability to see that full, like you said, it goes into like a, a department and it adds value and then it moves out of the department, you know, no longer my problem, but everything now for you is, your problem because you're able to see the the total supply chain of of content um how has that background of supply chain management how do you find that every day in your your new role i mean it's it's something that's i've seen 
in every almost every role I've had and in going to conferences, talking on webinars like this, talking with just other people in the industry, it is the same issue everywhere. And I was very surprised to learn how much my supply chain background really translated to this content management world, because it is very similar. You have things that are being created all the time, whether it's new products, new data, new marketing ca campaigns, and they need to be able to get to your consumers. And I have just found it's, it's amazing how similar those worlds are when you can break it down to this the objective thinking of getting something from A to B and how each step can add or remove value based on how you do it. I found myself making value stream maps, which is quite literally like how you cut the fat in a, in a uh, transportation process for how we actually create content and data. Love that. That's for some folks that are, I'll, I'll call it, don't have that background trying to get that experience now. I think that's an awesome cheat code uh, that you just came up with in terms of how to map a trans creation process. Um, would love to hear more about that. That's a, that's a whole nother podcast episode, I think, <laughs> that we can get into. So uh, then you move from Kraft Heinz um, along. What's next in your journey? So I actually worked in a, a number of different roles at Kraft Heinz, just kind of going across the board. And from there, I had a few kind of half stints in consulting where I would either just kind of as part of different programs, work with people I knew in the industry, either through uh, conference workshops, either through just kind of short term paid gigs with people I knew in the industry or friends of mine that needed specific expertise for a short period of time. But my next core step was CarMax. Yeah. And I was so, so excited because um, they were in a place where they're just kind of discovering um, a dam, what it can do, why they would really want it. And so I have this vision of what I can do to build it from the ground up. Um, and I was just very excited about the opportunity. And um, where we are today is, I think the big thing that was interesting to me in the switch is Kraft Heinz, giant CPG company full of, I think I, think I counted, it was around 30 to 40,000 unique products to a company that doesn't have products. CarMax doesn't really have products. They sell a service. And in my opinion, honestly, a very good one. I have been nothing but impressed with the business model that we've had since I started. But it's a very different journey for content because now you're not creating something that can be just identified down to a specific universal G10 by industry standard. Now it's identifying what markets you're going for, what consumers you're targeting, what campaign this is and what reach it has. It is very much a more creative solution. And that very much complicates the, uh, the content journey because you just have so many options. Everything is, uh, I, I'm sorry, anything is possible. But the thing that we, that I see a lot in the industry is even though anything can be possible, people try very hard to make everything possible. They get overwhelmed. They end up with a lot of clutter in their environment and it just becomes a giant knot that needs to be untangled. And it's very difficult once you get to that knot. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, your background too is really interesting in your, your placement here and your mission now with CarMax, which is they don't have products, but could you argue the content that you create are your products? And would you, do you have folks thinking content is our new product? Let's manage our content like a product manager would, would manage content potentially. Absolutely. And I think that's the struggle. And, I, I, and it comes back to, um, to the, the differences between the uh, companies in your niche. And those definitions are so important. Is the content our product? Are our cars our product? Is our experience our product? Is our omni-channel presence our product? Our ability to you know, uh, join you in any part of the, co uh, the car buying journey digitally or in person? What really is that? And people have so many different definitions for what that is. And that is part of you know, issues across the industry is this idea of, once again, in silos, I am doing my job and this is my product, not we have a mission together. This is our product. Um, I think that is a symptom of just a, such a long time of legacy waterfall procedures and just a set way of doing things. I mean, you always hear this as the cliche is like the most interesting thing in the world is that's just the way we do things. Um, and I think we're growing very, very well beyond that. I think we've made a lot of positive strides. I would love more than anything to get content to be our product. 
I want to see that as our emerging, um, our emerging effort, because bringing that kind of consolidation and vision, that's how you start to have a more solid standardized taxonomy. That's how you have a more collaborative vision where you can say the same thing and it is all one language to people or at least close enough. Um, that is definitely something I, I would say people should strive for across the board is whether it's content or not, having that definition, defining it, having that understanding. Absolutely. I think your, your time working, even in your consulting days, that ability to, uh, that we'll get into the cultural aspects, the human element of a lot of this, because a lot of this is, is change. It's, it's vision setting, it's reinforcement, it's selling ideas. And then the technology really just, you know, a facilitator of, of that change. So definitely want to get there before we jump into your, I want to talk about your ground up build, because I think that's, there's, there's a, like a massive cheat code and, and how you tackle this problem. But, um, just on your business today with, with CarMax, I was mentioning earlier, and as a consumer of vehicles, I never imagined I would not be able to test drive a car before I had to commit to financially buying it. How has the automotive industry and what you're solving for at CarMax gotten to such a place where the content, the digital experience has to now serve as what used to be the medium of commercial transactions in a physical world, there's no more kicking physical tires. Like we're kicking digital tires potentially. What, ha what have you seen specifically that uh, has changes in you know, the automotive industry? How has that heightened the importance of the digital experience? I may not be the best person to answer from, from like a stand, a standpoint of the automotive industry, how that has changed and how that is like being enforced. But what I can say, no matter what is it's getting the right information to uh, the customer and allowing them to have the freedom to look for exactly what they want. And so that, that means getting 360 degree views of the cars. That means being able to have, uh, images of all the different unique features between the different trims of a car. Do I want the standard package? Do I want the luxury package? Do I want the super luxury package? How does that change my dashboard? What am I looking at in the screen? What are these little things that I wouldn't know about if I didn't see the actual physical car? I can read it and it can sound great. And I'm going to feel like I'm getting a sales pitch from a car salesman because that's just the stigma of cars. And it should be because it's a huge financial decision. And if I don't have all those little details, there's always going to be some part of me that's uncertain, that feels like I'm getting taken advantage of. So it's not only having all those visuals, but having the data to go along with it and being able to translate it in a consumer friendly uh, fashion. I'll be the first to admit it. I am the furthest thing from a car guy. When I was interviewing at CarMax, I legitimately asked if I, is it going to be a problem that I don't know anything about cars? Cause I really don't. I know things about content and system technology. Yeah. Um, and so you get all this data from the car manufacturers, all this very engineering sounding lingo of what these things can do. And it means nothing to me, but being able to have that for car savvy people, but being able to translate it in a way for any average person to say, this is what I'm buying. That's what makes it so important. And it has to be universal. It can't just be for different uh, picks of vehicles. It has to be something you can really universally apply. Um, and I think, the omni-channel experience, which I'm seeing across the automotive industry has become so important because not only do we live online, we just don't want to go to a car sales, we just don't want to go to a car lot. Right. Um, and it's very difficult. The car lots, the digital car lots like right here. <laughs> yeah. And it's a huge undertaking. I don't think anyone really has mastered it as of yet. And I think everyone is really trying and that content journey, those specifics, that universal exposure is so, so crucial. Yeah. And the, I'll call it the, the, the truth factor in that, like, I'm going to buy it after you've done a lot is trust. You've, you've created a digital experience with enough content where you, the consumer gets to a point of, I actually trust that that's the right one for me. And then whoever's serving up the product from there gets, gets the business. So I, yeah, I'm just, I'm blown away by the, how content create can create trust in the transaction equation. Now I want to get to your, your ground up build, um, you know, Digital asset management. Talk to me about when you think when you go into the, a problem like at CarMax and your ground up build uh, for this content supply chain. Chain dam. Sort of. I want to know where you see digital asset management in that supply chain. Is it at the center? Is it at, at the core? Is it foundational? Sort of that thinking of where this system thinks. 
when you go into this problem, what are the, some of the first things you do when assessing the, the needs, the content needs to bring digital asset management into an, an enterprise? To answer that, I have to give you a little bit of background into, you know, what you should be thinking about when you, if, if you're trying to decide on a dam, what you should be thinking about. And the classic consultant answer, as always, is it really depends. But again, that definition is so important. So I'll give you my end goal for a dam. In an ideal world where I am, an end goal for a dam for me is building an operational system of record for the entire enterprise, a single source of truth, something that must be complete, accurate, and current. That is something that is kind of an idealized version across an industry, and it can be applicable in a lot of cases, but it's not always exactly what you need to do. And I think for wherever you are, defining that vision, why you have a dam, what you intend to use it for, why it is adding value to you, that is what you need to consider when you look at those problems. If I'm, if I give her a problem, whether it's something wrong with the system uh, functioning, whether we need to find a new process to make things easier for uh, assigning security and allowing access on um, approved, approved basis, it needs to, it needs to fall in line with that vision. Am I, am I solving this in a way that is aligned to a vision or is this a problem that needs to be addressed the way it's being asked? Is there a different approach I have to take because the way that we want people to use DAM involves processes. Are they going about it the wrong way? Should we just approach it from a different angle? And all of these things need to be considered, but they need to be considered toward the goal that you and the company have. And that goal is gospel. That's what's so important. And that's what's so necessary for a successful DAM. Yeah. When you, uh, in terms of goals and outcomes, value drivers, some of the you know business benefits um obviously delivering on the digital experiences which drives you know revenue uh what are some of the when when building your business case for dam some of the the qualitative quantitative things you know whether that be time to market whether that be you know uh risk mitigation of some sort uh findability of content reuse of content cost reduction what are some of the i'll call it Val big value drivers you typically would build your business case around? Speed to market, reuse, security, I think are my big three. Um, and I think the biggest of those actually is security. I can't tell you how much usage rights goes into a dam and depending on your implementation surrounding systems as well. But if there's one thing I learned just going into the content world is how much I have to read contracts now. Yeah. Because I need to understand very thoroughly what's happening. I need to understand a lot around the different agreements we have, what they're being used for, how they should be used, and make that something translatable. And that's something that, you know, based on your implementation goes to a, uh, it can go to a, a whole host of different people. But it's so important to me to understand usage rights because that's something that can blow up on a company so easily. If you make an agreement with especially SAG talent, um, the Studio Actors, Actors Guild. Yeah. Using it out of compliance is a big deal. It really can be. And even if you do small time talent um, and you are using it out of compliance, it can either turn into whether or not you win or lose a lengthy and expensive lawsuit or just an endless series of forced renewals. And now not only do you have stagnant content, you're paying for something over and over again that you don't need to. Um, so that usage rights management is so important because being able to do it successfully means having a successful product life cycle and making sure people just know what to use. A creative, an art director, a business partner looking for something, giving them that confidence to say, yes, I have this, I can use it, and I don't have to worry about it ever again. It's such a relief. And that goes into human capital. Making the lives of your employees easier is always a good thing. I cannot stress enough how much of importance companies really need to have on their human capital <laughs> because yeah. anything that makes them happy, anything that makes their lives easier means you keep good people and you keep them happy and you make them, you encourage them, you give them a platform to be successful. And that's so important. I love that. Yeah, we uh, we tend to, we've been calling that content 360 lately where we've got this full like open view of, you know, we've got the 180 sort of outside the organization of our content out there working for us. Now there's the other 180, like the full view back into the organization of human capital. And um, in this case, security, um, you know, processes, people, 
And if, if you've got that full content 360 view and approach with these, I'll call it underpinnings of the content supply chain, like that's like the strategy for the future. Yep. Happy people accomplishing business objectives all at the same time. Yeah, I love that. Uh, digital rights management, uh, usage rights, uh, a huge uh, pillar of business value in there. Um, For the other two, uh, like speed to market and just reuse, I mean, that's just, it, it's really just making it easier. And that, that, like, easier to find, easier to use, easier to get out to your consumers, and most importantly, easier to get specific content to your users. And that's where we come into a stable, standardized, to at least some degree, data taxonomy, and yeah. talk about an undertaking. That is something that takes a lot of alignment across a lot of different people, a lot of very long conversations to get to, but it is so, so worth it because being able to have someone just go into a dam, do a search, click a couple of filters and get exactly what they're looking for, or at least close enough, it's so powerful. And being able to have, when it's not new creative, when it's not something that has to be created every time, a static set of assets, signage that we're going to use across multiple stores or different websites, legal disclaimers that we have to use everywhere, being able to have a static place to say, oh, I need this new sign. Oh, okay, I know exactly where that is. Go download use. Even better if you have it systematized and you can have it be a, like, um, a damn two system communication to just click a button and say, publish. Um, those things, I mean, we're getting into more idealized versions of DAM, but being able to get to that place is just so powerful. And I think that's what people need to realize about, you know, why would I get a DAM? It's for that idealized version. And it is, trust me, a long journey and a commitment yeah. to get to, but the places that you can go with it, if you really commit is just so, so powerful. Yeah. That's, that's very, you know, future forward thinking. And then you mentioned in there that, that, that use case around, well, reuse. Mm -hmm and findability, I found that a lot of folks spend, the folks that do it really well, do it right, and I know you are too, the content architecture that you've got um, in place in the content operation. So this idea of understanding your content, your digital assets at a very deep and granular level, and then actually having that be part of how the supply chain starts, moves along and finishes. How do you, how does, how do you see the content architectures that you put in place? What are some of your strategies for, a, I'll call it a winning content architecture that's building for that, you know, that future of that we were just talking about? So it, again, it depends on like what kind of industry you're in. So between the two that I have been mostly involved with is the CPG product-based and the CarMax service-based. Product-based, uh, which I think is the, the more popular or more common uh, use of this, I would say the big things that you need are your master data system where everything is being used across like across logistics, sales, everything um, to make sure you have everything that goes into what is, which is what is this product? You have your PIM, your product information management system. This is your marketing system. This is where your brand can go in, edit your content, make sure that they have their romance copies, their different titles, their different SEO uh, features based on their destinations. What does Walmart need? What does Amazon need? What does tar uh, Target need? All these different marketing copies that can go to custom locations. You have your DAM. You have your digital asset management system, and this is specifically for your artwork. Everything that goes into this one package of a product, all of its different artwork for all its different promotions be, being accessible, tying to that PIM record. So that one record can apply all the data in specific context to all the different artwork versions of this asset. And then a CMS. A, a, customer, a, a customer management system, a consumer management system, a content management system, whatever you want to call it. They just go by thousands of different names. But this is the way that you can take all of this different customized content, organize it in one place, and this is your publishing platform. This is where you can say, send this to Amazon, send this to Target, send this to Jet.com, wherever you want to send it. And it's a place where people can go and fine tune and create custom uh, content for your consumers. And all of this, all these systems is a two-way communication because you want this data to be sacred. You want it to be a single source of truth. You don't want to change something in the PIM that's not reflected in DAM. You don't want to fine tune something in a CMS that now doesn't go back to these systems to say, this is what the sacred record is. So that all is just so, so important. Um, for a service industry, it again, really depends on what you want to do. But I would say no matter what, a workflow, whether that goes to a PIM or to your DAM, a workflow where you can really manage your content, how it's created, where the data comes from, and how the data is assigned. And at the very least, 
some publishing system outside of DAM. DAM can handle publishing in a lot of different cases, but it can cause systematic issues. I can't tell you how many conversations I've had about different CDNs and like publishing uh, um, processes, but having that kind of layer of the CMS just allows people on a non-technical background or even a non-marketing background to be able to look at everything that's been created and yeah. really get it to where it needs to go. So I would say at least that workflow DAM and CMS for a service base. And this can be expanded across so many different um, like configurations of an architecture, but those would be the baselines. Yeah. And you mentioned a lot of pieces of technology in there. There's a lot of, I talked to folks and there's this idea of like composable tech stacks. So rather than just, I'll call it the one monolithic platform that's going to do everything. It sounds like you're piecing together a, a composable tech stack that's potentially best in breed capabilities, PIM, DAM, um, CMS, et cetera. What are, what's your thought process on the, I'll call it the technology architecture sort of fitting together to make this all real? I'm not quite certain I understand the question. Of all the, uh, the ability to choose uh, sort of best in breed technologies versus the just going with one vendor for all their ah. capabilities. So again, it comes down to what, what that vision of DAM is. Do you really need it to be an enterprise scaled system where you have all of your images? Do you need it to be something where you're just storing specific static sets of assets and doing for usage rights management? Like what is that actual use? And that, that helps answer your question because you could absolutely pay the most money for the top quality solutions and have the most robust functionalities at your disposal. But is that what you really need? And that's the question that comes down to every implementation based on what your budget is and what your function is. If you really do want to go enterprise, I am I, I am very much for you know exploring what is a top solution and what will give you the most robust functionality. Um, but that's why you can compartmentalize. That's why you have things like PIMs, DAMs, CMSs, packaging systems, even recipe management systems. And it comes down to what each individual piece really needs to do and what you want your dam to do. I would say that compartmentalization is really important because trying to put everything in one solution, it has its benefits and it can be very successful, but I also see it very easily leading to confusion because now you're trying to manage everyone with everyone's different expectations of what this system is. And that system now means 10 different things to a hundred different people and it can just be cumbersome. It's not impossible to manage, but you definitely need the manpower to be there to support all these different teams. I am more of a fan of making sure you have these different steps in the architecture so they each have their purpose. It's very easy to understand, it's very easy to follow, and you can set expectations for where you're inputting information versus where you're pulling information out instead of having one system that's doing everything. Again, yeah. There's no right or wrong solution. It depends on what your specific needs are, but I've always liked the compartmentalized architecture. Yeah, I love that. And what you hit on like that, the push and pull, ascending the sharing of data, the idea, the integration capabilities, the openness of it, APIs, et cetera, the passing of data, super important for a strategy like that. Compartmentalized, but yet connected very tightly. Now, you were also hitting on, I want to talk about the human aspect of mm -hmm. this solution. Uh, technology is not going to do all the work. We actually need humans in the mix. <laughs> It'd be easy maybe without humans. Um, but um, so your, your time with moving through, I'll call it cultural transformation, um, what are some of your cheat codes when working with, with people, with different departments? with um, sort of evaluating the as is state to understand we're going to have to change, right? It, you had the, that statement earlier around that's just how we do things. You're, in, you're a, a change agent and you're, you come in and say, well, we're not going to do them like that anymore. We're, that made sense for us years ago, but the future is how do you approach the, you know, the cultural aspects, the human aspects of change management that's absolutely needed for success? Uh, the, the very, the very quick answer is ask a lot of questions. People like to talk about what they're doing and they like to give information about why what they do is so important and asking them just a lot of questions. It will be an information overload, but you want to really understand the people and departments you work with. What's important to them? What their real goals are? 
a lot of people, I think a, a, a thing that I've heard a lot of people uh, like get feedback from when I'm uh, trying to investigate these systems is this is what we do. This is what they need. This is what our vendors need. This is what our partners need. This is what our consumers want. And something that I've really learned to ask is, are you sure? Like legitimately, just are you sure? When was the last time you talked to talk to them about what they need? What is really important? What it physically, what the minimum minimum viable product it takes to get your your content to your consumers and i think people have been stuck in this for so long they think this is just what we do but going back and asking the vendors having that aspect of vendor relationship management across all this is really important because from sourcing your information to distributing your information knowing really what it takes that helps you cut out a lot of fat you can start to x out a lot of processes that aren't needed you can start to simplify your names you can start to simplify your data what you're really collecting and that's what a lot of this really is a damn system a pen system a content management system it's not doing people's jobs for them it's making it so they don't have to go through a lot of slog of manual work it's eliminating as much of that fat as possible so you can really just do your job the thing that you're good at whether it's creativity whether it's um campaign planning whether it's understanding consumer to know what to get to them that is what people are specialized in and all of this is meant to just knock out any of that fat so going back to it ask a lot of questions understand really what your departments need and what they need to get it where it's going help them do the stuff they don't want to do because i guarantee you they don't want to do it they just think they have to i love that yeah seek first to understand then you, you really know your patient who you're working with uh what makes them you know, uh, what wakes them up at night, what makes them happy. Um, and then you start to get to that, uh, uh, the psychology um, that's going to allow you to drive change appropriately, uh, minimizing you know, friction potentially and resistance. So there's a common pitfall here too, because some people really, really like to get involved. They like to be in the weeds of it and they like to have their two cents. And especially when that becomes a lot more broad, now you have a hundred voices in your ear, all expressing some different version of this niche and it becomes overwhelming and it's very difficult. And people start to get um, a little bit encumbered. They lose interest because they see this kind of very daunting task in front of them and they can no longer spend hours of like their hours in a week trying to commit to this product that we're trying to you know standardize or this process that we're trying to improve because they actually have real jobs to do and resources across the industry. People, it's, it's hard. People are strapped for time. Time is a very rare, rare commodity. And I hate, I hate, hate, hate trying to make people work 60, 80 hour weeks. I am very against it. I want this to be easy. I want you to go home and spend time with your families. Like it's ridiculous to try and expect this of people. And so now you have to do what do you, how you time manage. And instead of trying to get them in these working sessions and build these processes week over week and having them just see tired and get bored of it, I really like to build small solutions. Like don't make them, don't make them try and build it with you all the time. Like get as much as you can, but when you can see that fatigue setting in, build something for them, let them see it. Let them really understand what you're doing because I have found people are way better critics than they are at system building because that's not what their specialty is. Build something for them so they can tell you why it's wrong or why it's right or why it's helpful. And then you get this re-sparked interest because now they have something in front of them they can work with. Like, oh, this is great. Or Greg, what the hell did you do? This is this is this is terrible. You can't, we can't, we can't use this. But that starts a conversation. That starts something that we can now have a platform of and continue to build it. And even if it's one department at a time, it helps. Because if you can get even one department or one team successful, people will get jealous very fast. How come they can do this so easily? Why is it so easy for them? Why can't I use all of these images? And now you have another way to start the conversation. Well, let's take a look at the foundation we have. Does this work for you? How can we tailor it to your needs? Um, so like I, all this, I, I can't say any of this is this is the way to do it. It's all a fine line and you have to dial in your audience, but it's finding those ways to make the conversation engaging. Yeah, I love that. Give them something to react to. One way to, or if I could reframe it, one way to cut tremendous cycle time out and to gain adoption is to put out some level of MVP for your audience to react to, get their feedback right or wrong, and then adjust from there. Because seeing really is believing in this case. And then they'll start giving feedback. They'll start owning some of the idea evolution moving forward. So that's an awesome cheat code right there for yep. multiple different factors. And you were actually hitting on 
my last question that I love and audience loves, which is mistakes. Um, you mentioned that it's a mistake. Uh, be careful. It's a pitfall. What's another big mistake that either you've made, you've seen happen that uh, we'd want to, I'll call it, let folks know this is a road you want to be careful going down it when, when driving, you know, forward digital asset management or building solutions or um, what's something that uh, we'd put a caution sign on. I maybe just be full of cliches for you today, Ed, but it is, it's an oldie, but so, so true. Do not let perfect get in the way of good. Because yeah. one, there's no such thing as perfect. I don't care if you have the best team and unlimited budget, you're never going to make a solution that is perfect. You are always going to be building. You are always going to be changing. Nothing is ever going to be set in stone. Things can last a while, even years. But if you try and strive for that perfect solution before you release anything, you're never going to get anything done. Try and find that minimum viable product. Make small steps. Get releases on the board. And people are terrified of this because that takes money. It yeah. does. It takes money and commitment. And now you're pay paying for something, developing something, implementing something. Maybe you won't even have in six months. Maybe you won't even have in a year. But it's important because it sets those foundations, set those precedents. Keep building. Do not let perfect get in the way of good. I cannot stress that enough. Love that. Do not let perfect get in the way of good. That's a, that's a mantra for everybody in our space right now, especially at the speed at which we need to move. A high cost of you know time and elongation of cycles and it's just like the new culture and mindset and you know this idea of you know seeing things um earlier love that i would say for another one like i mean again don't be afraid of failure but i think people lean on that very heavily just because you don't have to be afraid of failure doesn't mean you can always take this shotgun approach and just throw everything at the wall and see what sticks. It's good in some situations, but you need to be able to kind of dial it in, allow yourself to take chances or allow yourself to build things that you might, you know, it might not work. But don't let that be your mantra forever because you can start to use it as a coping mechanism or an excuse for how things are going. And again, all this is a very fine line. You have to be okay with failure. I can't tell you the amount of mistakes I've made, the emergencies I've had, the things I've had to, you know, really dive into to fix. But you still need to be thinking about the big picture. You can't just use that as your coping mechanism the entire way through. And it's hard. It is. Um, but I think just embracing it is the one thing you is something that's super helpful and you're never going to get feedback from someone like myself or an expert in the industry of like this is what i did and this is the mistakes i've made so now you don't have to make them you're going to make them and you're <laughs> going to have to make them it's the yeah. only way you really learn you can hear about a thousand different people's journeys but until you make your own mistakes that's really how you feel it and believe in it and understand it going forward so don't think you can just listen to a lot of these things and then get it you have to be able to make your own mistakes. It, it really is how you bounce back yep. that that makes the, the biggest difference personally, professionally. Uh, that's awesome. Greg, thanks for coming on the show. How can folks who've listened today follow you? Um, LinkedIn or what are the best ways to, to reach out if they want to keep a conversation going on with you? Yeah, absolutely. I would say LinkedIn. Um, there are a number of times that it, whether it's through conferences or webinars like this, I will just uh, give my information on my website out just because I enjoy these kind of conversations, especially from content management. There have been different times where I've tried to organize a couple of different people and have meetings like once a month just to talk about content management journey, different systems, different solutions, what works for people. Um, so absolutely, uh, people can follow me on that. Reach out to me. I'm always open for a conversation. Awesome. Yeah, we'll put some links in the, the show notes here so folks can get in touch with you. Greg, thanks so much. I appreciate it. Thanks for, thanks for being on the show. Absolutely. This has been a great time, Ed. Thank you so much.